It's Friday, everybody. Time for another Random Friday Boxing Chat. Got a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, A few things on my mind that I want to rant about. The phone lines are open, so if you want to chat, go ahead and call in. You guys know the number. Um, I should mention that the Spence Garcia weigh-ins just wrapped up, and both men made weight. No surprise there. They are both consummate professionals who take their careers seriously. Both Errol Spence and Danny Garcia always show up in shape and on weight. So uh, both those guys look good, and I expect a good fight tomorrow night in Texas. That should be a good one. Although you guys already know how I feel about that fight uh, in regards to who you think, who I think will win. If you want to talk about it, get on the line, call in. But I want to talk about two other subjects that kind of relate to that fight uh, in, in a particular way. Uh, first, before I get to my two subjects, well, I should mention, one of them is going to be women's boxing. Okay, we're going to talk about women's boxing, equal pay, uh, Clarissa Shields moving over to MMA because she says boxing is sexist. We're going to talk about that. I'm going to give you guys some statistics that will probably blow your mind. And then we're going to talk about the Tyson vs. Jones pay-per-view, how that uh, trended. It broke through. It did apparently 1.2 to 1.5 million pay-per-view buys. That's got people freaking out because they're excited, but then they're like, damn, man, with all these other pay-per-views combined, couldn't match uh, Tyson Jones. What's going on? What's that mean for the business? I'll talk about that. Before I get into it, though, I want to uh, answer a question from my man, John Uden. He sent this question via Patreon. I uh, appreciate it, John. He asks, uh, do you think Canelo moving to 168 pounds could be motivation for Billy Joe Saunders to turn it up a bit and try to stop Murray? Of course, they're fighting. Uh, They should be fighting pretty soon as I'm recording this. That card, uh, that broadcast just started on the zone a little while ago, I think. So they should be fighting in a little while, maybe two, three hours from now. Uh, I continue with John's question. He says, I don't begrudge a prize fighter for any money they get. But has Saunders ever shown that he has any particular passion for legacy in the sport? He seems to fight because he's good at it and he can cash big checks against lackluster competition. Do you think the Canelo payday could finally get him to shit or get off the pot? I'll go as far as a possible cash out fight for him. Good stuff, John. Uh, Yeah, listen, so those of you who follow me on Twitter, you know, uh, you saw my Twitter handle this week, Michael. Uh, quote unquote, Billy Joe Saunders fight week Montero. What's funny is a couple of my haters like save screen that. And I saw some posts. I, I don't even, I think it was on Facebook where this kid was saying, Oh, look at him. Of course he loves Billy Joe Saunders. They didn't get that I was joking. I was dissing Billy Joe Saunders and having a little fun with him. Of course, haters, they never understand. They don't understand sarcasm. Anyway, let me just talk really briefly about Billy Joe Saunders. Not going to spend too much time on this. I want to get right into the women's boxing debate, but I did want to address your question, John. Uh, Billy Joe Saunders, 29-0, 14 knockouts. He should stop Martin Murray, right, when they fight later on today. Martin Murray has not beat a top-level fighter in ages. So, on the surface... Saunders should stop him. But check this out, man. If you just look at his record, okay, uh, and I'll go over his accomplishments in just a second, but his fights against Spike O'Sullivan, John Ryder, Chris Eubank Jr., Andy Lee, Arthur Akaroff, uh, Willie Monroe, David Lemieux, those are his best opponents of his entire career. Every single one of them went the distance. Now, some of those opponents are, none of them are elite But some of them at their very, very best were definitely top 10 guys, maybe even borderline top five guys in their division. And uh, but some of them weren't. And um, although I will say Andy Lee might have been elite at one point, he might have been right there, maybe just shy of elite, but definitely a top guy. But not when Saunders fought him. Saunders went the distance against all those guys. So he should stop Martin Murray. And I. I don't think he gives a shit about luring Canelo with a big statement knockout. Canelo's going to fight whoever the hell he wants to fight, whenever the hell he wants to fight. And they already negotiated with Saunders before for a fight with Canelo, as has Golovkin and his people uh, talked to Saunders. So I don't think he's going to step it up against Murray to try to lure Canelo. He's going to do his thing. 
He should stop Murray, but don't be surprised if that shit goes the distance. Seriously, it's really up to Martin Murray and how much punishment he wants to endure. Um, he's an older guy. He's been in there. But it, it, the only guy I can really think of that bludgeoned him and stopped him was when he fought Golovkin. I think it was like the 11th or 12th round when they fought. And that had to be years ago, man. So what does he have left in the tank? I don't know. But, man, seriously, guys, this thing could go the distance. I mean, I'm not going to watch the damn fight. I have zero interest in it. A couple of uh, undercard fights or fighters you, know, you might want to take a, a look at. But anyway, um, so Billy Joe Saunders, on the surface, he should be one of Canelo's top challenges, right? He's tall. He's rangy. He's a southpaw. He does have boxing skills. He did take O's from Spike O'Sullivan, John Ryder, and Chris Eubank. But you're going back to 2013, 2014, those guys were prospects back then, okay? So Saunders has proven that he's above that level, but not much else so far. His career highlight, of course, is shutting out David Lemieux in 2017. That was two years after the Triple G beat down. So, um, yeah, man, I, I just... Here's what I think is going to happen with Saunders. His team is going to do everything they can to ensure he keeps his O. Because his O... And him being from the UK is what makes him marketable for Canelo Alvarez and their people, right? Going forward, they need opponents at 168. Saunders has a chunk of a title. So he's going to have the O. He's going to have the UK fan base, although he's not very popular in the UK or anywhere. And he's going to have a piece of a title. That is going to be enough for Canelo Alvarez and the zone to make a fight with him. Do not be surprised if you see a fight between Canelo and Saunders in 2021 on the zone. Um, but, you know, I, I'm just looking at this, and I think Saunders will, will put up his career best performance against Canelo. He's going to know. He's taking a huge leap in opposition. He'll be competitive. You know, I, I get it. He'll probably go the distance. He'll probably go the distance with uh, with Canelo. But I don't see it being any more competitive uh, or going really all that different than Canelo's fight with Danny Jacobs. That's just how I see that fight playing out, man. All right, guys, let's jump. Oh, real quick. Uh, super chat pledge from Trent Nonpareil. Thank you so much, Trent. He says, uh, Savannah Marshall over Clarissa Shields. I test. Interesting. And a great segue into some of the things I want to talk about, man. Let's talk about this women's boxing stuff, okay, guys? And let's be let's be sensitive. Let's be inclusive, okay? Let, let, let's understand that this is a sensitive subject, all right? So let's not be disrespectful. I need to preface because it's 2020 and everyone's outraged all the time. But I'm going to say some things right now that are going to ruffle feathers, but I promise you every single one of them is based in logic, facts, and reason. That's why it's going to upset people. But uh, Clarissa Shields, well, let me back up just a little bit. There are uh, people on boxing Twitter, particularly. You guys know I'm, I'm, I'm uh, active on Twitter. I don't really do much on Instagram, Facebook, or, but on Twitter, I'm pretty active. And uh, you see boxing Twitter it is an interesting universe. There's a segment of boxing Twitter that fancies themselves activists, right? And it is their duty to fight for social justice. And the issue in the boxing community right now on boxing Twitter is equal pay and equal treatment for women boxers. And uh, several female fighters have jumped on this. Some network people, some promoters. I get why the promoters and the network people are jumping on. I even get why the fighters are jumping on. Uh, the Jake Paul thing, right? Jake Paul fought Nate Robinson, uh, former NBA star, last uh, Saturday uh, on the Tyson Jones undercard, and that once his purse got out there that this guy made six hundred thousand dollars a year. Guess what, folks? It was probably north of a million when you include pay per view upside. Uh, so yeah, he's probably got seven figures. Only his second pro fight going up against the Davis, although it was a world class athlete that he faced. Man, that triggered some people. That really triggered some people, particularly the women's boxing equal pay people. They pounced. And several fighters jumped on this. It all culminated um, with, uh, and you saw all the tweets and stuff, right? But Clarissa Shields also announced this week that she's jumping over into MMA, right? Now, I don't know the name of the promotion she signed with. I have no freaking idea. But I'm going to read you a couple of quotes, word for word, from an interview she gave on TMZ Sports in relation to this news that she is going to jump over to MMA. And we'll see how long this lasts and everything else. But... In an interview with TMZ Sports, uh, she was called boxing, quote-unquote, so sexist. She also goes on to say, and I quote, These men 
are fighting for multiple millions that haven't accomplished half of what I accomplished. We're going to revisit that quote in a minute. But I am supposed to just be happy? Like, yeah, go ahead and pay me 300 k and then offer me 150 k for the next fight? She goes further. Did everything I, I did everything I could do in boxing, and I still haven't made $1 million for a fight. And she talked about the fact that several um, networks, uh, her promoters have tried, but the network people have said that she doesn't have the number of social media followers uh, necessary to promote a pay-per-view type of event, which is what she's wanted. She's been clamoring for a pay-per-view match, which is insane, and a million-dollar-plus payday. <laughs> Now, to put this in perspective, Katie Taylor, currently rated number one by Ring Magazine. And by the way, if you haven't picked up the latest issue, it is out. Make sure you check it out. The Charlo Brothers here, Lions only on the cover. But we rate Katie Taylor number one pound for pound in women's boxing above Clarissa Shields. And that triggered a lot of people out there. But uh, to be clear, Katie has made a million dollar plus, or I should say million pound plus Paydays over in the UK. Uh, her promoter, Eddie Hearn, with Matchroom and Slash, uh, the, their uh, platform that they uh, produce on, at least here in the States, well, now in the UK and multiple other places um, around the world, the Zone, they have invested heavily in women's boxing and particularly with Katie Taylor. So we'll revisit the Katie Taylor versus Clarissa Shields thing in just a second. I want to focus on Clarissa here in some of her comments. I should also state, because again, it's 2020, everyone's outraged all the time. I want to preface, I have nothing against Clarissa Shields or women's boxing. You guys have seen, I have covered it. I've had female fighters on my show. We had the undisputed welterweight champion, Jessica McCaskill, and her trainer, Rick Ramos, uh, people that I've known for years. My wife and I uh, have traveled to their gym and hung out and stuff before. I've interviewed, I've covered her fights in Chicago. I've been there, interviewed her. Um, We've had them on the show. I have nothing against women's boxing, and I'm actually a proponent for it. I I, uh, recently uh, voted in the Women's Boxing Hall of Fame as part of my Hall of Fame voting. Um, I sit on the Ring Ratings Committee. I'm one of the guys at Ring that pushed to add female ratings, okay? So I'm a supporter of women's boxing when it's good. But I'm also, uh, I shouldn't say when it's good. I'm a supporter of women's boxing, period, okay? There's bad women's boxing. There's bad men's boxing, plenty of it. Billy Joe Saunders. So uh, I'm a supporter of boxing, period. All right. But I'm also a realist. And there's what upsets me. It's not just Clarissa Shields, but she's kind of become the face of it. Her and her army on social media. What, What annoys me is that these people do not provide nuance. They talk about a subject, an issue that is relevant in, in, in modern day in, in a political um, scheme of things right now. I, I get it. There, there's some relevance to what they're talking about, but they provide zero nuance. Uh, there, there's no objectivity. There's no data. So when, when uh, Clarissa Shields comment here that these men are fighting for multiple millions that haven't accomplished half of what I've accomplished – I want to stick with that because I do think that there's a little bit of delusion with Clarissa. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. I think it's, and it's not just her, it's, it's her and, and, and some of the fans out there and some of the social justice warrior types on Twitter that again, and nuance doesn't exist in 2020, right? To, to a lot of people out there, but guess what? It matters in the real world. It does matter. The totality of data and information matters and you got to stop comparing apples to oranges. You got to compare apples to apples. So let's talk about the three divisions Clarissa Shields has competed in. Super middleweight, then she moved down to middleweight, and now she's currently campaigning at junior middleweight. She has won titles at all three of those weight classes. Without a doubt, she is the most accomplished women's boxer from 154 to 168, and the best. She would beat anybody. If she wanted to jump right back up to 168 right now, I think she'd be the best in the world there again. So that's saying something, right? That's significant. If there was a fighter in men's boxing that could do that right now, we'd be calling him a future Hall of Famer. So it is significant. But here's the nuance. Here's where all this stuff, these inconvenient truths come into play. Looking at men's boxing, I I checked. And you guys could check this. Just go on box rec, okay? Just go on box rec. The number of licensed Male professional boxers in the world, I'm talking worldwide, from 154 to 168, 
it is a little over 5,000. 5,000. Okay, that means, again, I'm going to repeat this. I'm going to talk slow. So all the people whose assholes are getting clenched up right now and getting mad and gritting their teeth, slow down, relax, have a sip of a beer or something, just chill. Male boxers around the world campaigning at 154, 160, 168. I'm talking licensed professional boxers right now. Over 5,000. Can any of you guess how many women licensed professional female boxers currently campaigning in those three divisions exist on planet Earth right now? 117. So you're comparing 117 to well over 5,000. Okay? Think of the talent pool. There, there, what, one is a talent pool. The other is a talent, I, I can't even say puddle. It's a raindrop. It's a raindrop in that pool. 117 ranked female fighters from 154 to 168 compared to over 5,000 ranked men. I'm going to break it down by division real quick, okay? In uh, 154 pounds. And I should state, the talent pool for men's and women's boxing gets deeper as you go down the weight scale. It's, it's very interesting. There are more licensed male boxers at 135 than there are at 175 because there are more options for bigger guys to go into different sports, right? So that is not just a phenomenon in, in women's boxing. It exists in men's boxing as well. But with women, they don't make women as big as men for the most part. There are exceptions to every rule. But men, generally speaking, are bigger. There's more guys walking around at 175, 200 pounds than there are women. It doesn't mean there aren't some women who are that size and are very athletic. They're out there. But for the most part, there are more women, female athletes, who weigh under 150 pounds than over. Okay? Uh, more so than with men, right? I'd say with men, it's the opposite. There's probably more athlete, men who are athletes who weigh more than 150 pounds worldwide than uh, below. But at 154, there are 53 ranked female fighters. At 160, there are 40 ranked female fighters. At 168, there are 24 fighters on earth. Okay? Think about this for a second. When Clarissa Shields, number one, when she won the, her titles at 168... Uh, there wasn't 24 ranked fighters, or 24 licensed, I sh they're not ranked, licensed fighters, I should say, in the world. It's almost, that division's almost doubled in size since she went pro. But right now, if we're considering her the top super middleweight in the world, she is the best of 24. So, as it relates to her statement before, these men are fighting for multiple millions that haven't accomplished half of what I've accomplished. I go back to these ratios. Let's stick with 168. Callum Smith is about to fight Canelo Alvarez at 168. Callum Smith, regardless if you think he's the best or not, he's uh, with the eye test. He is currently rated at the top of the 168 division because he got the ring belt. He went through the tournament, right? Now, I, personally, I don't think he's the best. I think David Benavidez would beat him. I think Caleb Plant, that's a 50-50 fight. I think Canelo's going to smoke him. But him being the current number one rated fighter at 168 and stepping up to fight the biggest brand in the sport, one of the biggest brand in all of sports, Canelo Alvarez, he's getting seven figures for that. Would you guys consider Clarissa Shields being worth that kind of money? No. It doesn't make any sense that Clarissa Shields would be making anywhere near what Callum Smith is about to make for her fight. Yet, if you listen to what she says word for word and you don't understand the, the ins and outs and the nuances and the fine print and the gray area in the sport of boxing, you would think, holy shit, this is an outrage. This Callum Smith guy is about to fight for seven figures against Canelo Alvarez, a fight that he's uh, the, the betting underdog. Meanwhile, Clarissa Shields is the best in three divisions, and she's getting $300,000. This is sexism. And let's just throw racism on top of it because Clarissa's hinted to that before. So because, you know, 2020, everything has to be about race all the time, even when it has nothing to do with it. Is Clarissa Shields more accomplished than Callum Smith? Now here, again, I'm just using these two as an example. I'm not trying to beat up on them or anything like that or say that they have anything in common because they don't. But... Is Callum Smith simply winning a title 
and, and winning a tournament at 168 as a male boxer, does that make him more accomplished than Clar- Clarissa Shields winning two titles at 168? I'm going to say yeah. Because, again, when you look at who's rated, how many fighters are in that talent pool that Callum Smith is fighting in, it's an ocean compared to a pond. Okay? So, yeah, for Clarissa to say that she's more accomplished than – or these dudes have accomplished half of what she has, I think that's a ridiculous statement. And it doesn't take into consideration everything I just told you guys about. And I could keep going. By the way, Clarissa Shields has won eight world titles. She's 10-0 and with two knockouts, two stoppages, I should say. Um, but eight of, or I'm sorry, six of the eight world titles that she's won were vacant. Six of eight were vacant. What does that mean? That further just clarifies and, and solidifies what I was just talking about in relation to no talent pool, it's a talent pond, or not even that, a uh, talent puddle, sorry. It's not a talent pool, it's a talent puddle. Because six of the eight titles she fought for were vacant. That means she's only fought and defeated two uh, former or current world title holders, right? That shows you the level of opposition that she's facing. Now, is that her fault? Absolutely not. But for her to be talking about, I should be getting a million dollar plus, I should be getting pay-per-views, and to not to just jump to sexism or jump to racism, which she has before she's hinted to it, that's where I take issue. And for all these people on Twitter to jump on and pile on and run with this like it's a legitimate thing, when all these other factors exist that I just talked about that are much more relevant when it comes to boxing and sports and entertainment in general, the economics involved... I mean, what the hell, guys? What are we talking about? I mention all this because it directly correlates to why Tyson Jones did one and a half million pay-per-view buys, and this upcoming pay-per-view tomorrow between Errol Spence and Danny Garcia won't even crack. Maybe it'll do 300, 350,000 buys, okay? But it won't crack 400. I doubt it will. It's all relevant. So When it comes to boxers' economic value, there's accomplishments. That's part of it. That's part of the equation. But there's also marketability. You have to have, you have to be a marketable product yourself. You know what? What separates boxing from other sports, and and, including other martial arts, is that in boxing, the fighter is the brand. The fighter is the product. Even if you go over to other martial arts like UFC, MMA, I should say, but UFC is the biggest product. I get it that Conor McGregor's a product, Jorge Masvidal, these guys are products, right? But UFC is the product. It is the trademark. It is the brand that casual sports fans recognize. With American football, it's the NFL. With American basketball, it's the NBA, et cetera, et cetera. With boxing, no casual fan out there knows who the hell Bob Arum or Al Heyman is. They don't know who the WBC or the WBA is. They couldn't give a shit. They don't even know the difference between a middleweight and a heavyweight. They really, really don't. What casual sports fans see when it comes to boxing is the fighter. That is the brand. That is why Mike Tyson and Roy Jones were able to sell a million-plus pay-per-views, and these dudes are in their 50s, Right? That fight, it was announced. This is an exhibition. There will be no winner. Snoop Dogg was a commentator. I mean, it was a circus. But because of their branding, people bought it. You know what I'm saying? That's what it's all about, guys. So we jump back to women's boxing. I talked about the difference in weight classes. I should also get back to Katie Taylor. Because again, 2020, everything has to be about demographics, race. And there's always this... um, us versus them paradigm. So now what you see a lot, especially once we at Ring promoted Katie Taylor to number one pound for pound, which she is, she's clearly more accomplished than Clarissa Shields. Uh, Once we did that and we gave our reasons for it, people started comparing the two of them, right? Well, if Katie's getting this, why isn't Clarissa? Oh, it must be because of fill in the blank, right? And it's never the correct reason. Well, I talked about the number of uh, fighters In the division, go down to lightweight where Katie Taylor campaigns, 135 pounds. There are over 2,300 male fighters, okay, over 2,300 male fighters. There are 169 female lightweights. Now, that's still only about 7% of, 
the what the the men have representation wise, you know, licensed fighters, only about seven percent are female, and it's it's about two percent on the divisions that Clarissa Shields campaigns in. But that goes to show you, man, it's more than three times that the talent puddle is more than three times as big, represent representative wise, than the divisions Clarissa Shields fights in. Consider this. I'm going to repeat this statistic. From 154 to 168, the three divisions Clarissa Shields fights in, there are 117 rated female fighters in those divisions. In the one division that Katie Taylor fights in, 135, there are 169. So the one division that Katie Taylor fights in has more fighters in it than the three that uh, Clarissa Shields fights in. About 150%, almost 150% as much, okay? Then factor in that Katie Taylor has defeated Delphine Pursoon. Forget about the first fight. If you fought, if you thought she lost that fight, cool. She clearly won the rematch. Clearly, right? And then she defeated Jessica McCaskill, who just moved up to uh, welterweight and beat Cecilia Brake, who's she's a pound for pound player. So Katie Taylor has defeated two girls on the pound for pound list. Clarissa Shields has defeated none on the pound for pound list. That is why I say Katie Taylor is more accomplished. Clearly, she's more accomplished. I can go further with this, okay? Um, let's see. I had the number here. Where did I put it? Where did I put it? Um, sorry, guys. I'm looking for ratings. Okay, Clarissa Shields uh, fight with Christina Hammer. That was her biggest fight. That was the biggest fight that she had in her entire career in terms of uh, commercial appeal and everything like that. She did a, a decent little crowd there. I think that fight was in Michigan, her home state. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but um, maybe a couple thousand people. But that fight on Showtime did 300 and I think about 350,000 views, right? 350,000 views. That was her biggest fight to date, 350,000 views. Katie Taylor over in the UK does significantly higher viewership, and she has uh, for pretty much her entire career. So I can take this further. We go to social media. Clarissa Shields has about 56,000 followers on Twitter. Katie Taylor has 200,000. Clarissa has 330,000 on Instagram. Katie Taylor has 360,000 on Instagram. So Katie Taylor has a higher, a bigger, she does bigger ratings on TV, on the zone. I should say, and then on Sky and everything over there in the UK. Internationally, she does a lot more in ratings, live ratings. She puts more butts in the seats in terms of ticket sales, and she has a bigger social media following. Some of you will jump to, oh, it's race, it's race, it's race. Well, look at Layla Ali. Remember her? Layla Ali, 140,000 followers on Twitter, over a million followers on Instagram. She's been retired from boxing for years. Layla Ali had national endorsements, national ad campaigns, both during her career and post-career. So it's not about race, guys. It's about marketability. I'll go further with this, and then I'll leave this one alone. I saw, I think, is that Mindyola on the chat? Yeah, man. Uh, I'm taking calls today, guys. The numbers are right behind me. 213-267-7787 in the USA. 020-810-36051 in the UK. Toll free. Uh, but man, I just lost my train of thought here. Um, da, da, da. I was talking about, uh, ah, damn it, you guys screwed me up. Oh, headlining cards. I hear a lot about, um, well, you know what? Uh, we should get equal pay. We should get equal opportunity. Dude, Clarissa Shields is, has headlined shows. So has Katie Taylor, Cecilia Brekus, uh, Michaela Mayer. They've all headlined shows. When you fight in a division that has 24 fighters and you're headlining shows on premium cable, I'd say you're being treated pretty equally. In fact, you're being treated disproportionately better than a lot of male fighters who are fighting on the eighth fight on an undercard um, in divisions that have thousands of of licensed fighters, okay? Also, when it comes to the amateur scene, you guys know there with female fighters, um, just started having uh, women's boxing in the Olympics recently. Men's boxing has been around forever in the Olympics. The talent pool there uh, is is vast. 
and quite different than in women's boxing, okay? So um, I will talk to the jump over to MMA in just a second, but I want to jump to a call real quick. Uh, we got somebody on the line here. Let me jump over here. 951, you're on the line. Go. What's up, Big Mike? This is Mike Mendiola from Cali. What up, Mendiola? How you doing, man? I'm good, man. You know, I know you've probably been getting inundated with, the, you know, the condolences, and I know that I sent you a personal message, and now that I'm on the air, I just wanted to once again say uh, what a pleasure it was to meet your brother a, a while back. I think I met him at the forum. You guys were there at a fight. Yeah. Super great guy, man. Um, super great guy, and I'm, I'm still keeping you in my prayers, brother. Thank you You so and your much, entire man. family. Thank you very much. But, hey, so real quick, to jump on the topic that you were – I'll be brief because I know you probably got a few guys trying to get in. But um, if I remember right, okay, we had a fighter that was fighting on that very last HBO card at um, – Well, it used to be Home Depot Center. Now it's Dignity Health Sports, whatever. And, yeah. I, and I, if, I, if I'm right, Bray Goose was the main event, but Clarissa Shields also fought on that card. Oh, you might be right. And, Is that when she fought Callie Reese? Oh, no, no. I, I think it was so. Brett Hoos. I can't remember. But, yeah, I remember. She did fight in that card, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I was there because one of our, our kids, Rene Moreno, he fought, I think, his second or third fight there. Either way, there was nobody there. And, yeah. you know, it is, it, you know, at the end of the day, Mike, I mean, you know, people are going to say it's sexist, whatever. This is a business before anything else. You hear guys like Bob Arum. You hear guys like Eddie Hearn and uh, um, the, the PBC guys say it all the time. This is a business before anything. And... Yeah. There's just, you know, I mean, you could sit anywhere that that day in the arena. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to venture to say they had about 500 people there. They announced the crowd at maybe like 1,000, but I'll be damned if there wasn't five 600 people there. It looked like a semi-pro football game. <laughs> I remember watching it on TV, and it was depressing. I think that was uh, – I think Max Kellerman on the call was uh, – he had laryngitis or something. He could barely talk, but he, you know, he wanted yes. to soldier through it. And wasn't it raining and shit, or am I just imagining that? Um, well, there was a fight there uh, just before that. I think where it had rained pretty good. Oh, I was at that and, one. That was the monsoon. That was before I moved to Atlanta. Um, damn, yes. was it Quig in uh, Valdez? I remember that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But but either way, at the end of the day, it, it's it's about the numbers, man. You're not putting butts in the seats. You know, you can't de- demand these, these 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 paydays. And you know, sadly, that was the last that we've seen of HBO boxing. Although I do kind of think one day down the line, I do think they're going to venture back into the world of boxing, especially now that Ring City is doing their little thing on NBC Sports. Yeah. I don't know if you're watching these cards, but they're pretty entertaining. The ones from um, I saw it last right outside night. the wall card, I guess. Yeah, it was cool the way they set it up in the parking lot. And I'm looking, you know, every now and then you catch a camera angle where you can see up the stairs into the gym. And I'm like, damn, dude, that just takes me back to all those times I was up there working out and stuff. It was it's just a cool setup, real cool setup. You know what the funniest thing about that entire broadcast, and I've watched both the cards from there, is about every one to three minutes you just hear sirens going by. I mean, because they can't drown it's out LA, that baby. Noise, and you just hear you hear fire, L.A., man, fire, yeah. fire, police, <laughs> pursuits, whatever. Yep, man, get the ghetto so, bird out there shining the lights and shit. Dude, every night, <laughs> not every night, but almost every other night, I'd just be awakened at 3 in the morning with the lights beaming through the window as they're looking for some guy, you know, <laughs> like all the time, man. Uh, memories. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, so, hey, hey, real quick, I want to just end on this last note. Um, I wanted to just uh, um, touch base a little bit. I haven't talked in a while. I just want to touch base a little bit on the fight uh, tomorrow, the um, Garcia Spence fight. Here's here's my quick prediction. I don't know if you if you give me just a minute to give me my prediction. Cool. I think Danny Garcia has a legitimate shot in this fight if he takes the fight to Errol Spence from the from the Jump Street. I know Air, Angel Angel Garcia was on record doing an interview. I think maybe with like Fight Hype or something, saying, "Well, well, they're going to be smart and they're going to box and counter." I'm thinking to myself, "You're not going to beat Errol Spence by allowing him to get in his groove." Mm-hmm. Errol Spence is like a, to me, he's like a motor. He's like one of those, like, you know, like Energizer Bunny. Once he gets going, he, he, you know, his, his punch output, it seems to just get better with each round. And, and if you catch him early and, 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 you know, Garcia does have, you know, he does have power. I don't want to say it, it's vaunted power because like you had said earlier on, on another, I think your broadcast earlier in the week, he hasn't really shown that power at 147. With the exception right. of the Granados fight, who and we all know Granados was fighting above his weight class. Right. So, 
But if Danny Garcia, if there is any lingering effects from, you know, the traumatic acts and, and the, the layoff and inactivity has, has affected Errol, Danny's got to jump on him quick. If it goes more than six rounds, Errol wins an easy unanimous decision. Might even, uh, you know, hurt or maybe even drop Danny late and maybe not by one punch, but just by an accumulation. Right. So that's my take on the fight, man. Um, I'll let you respond, you know, um, after I hang up. Have a great rest of the weekend, brother. Continuing to keep you in my prayers, man. Um, we have some uh, some new fighters we're working with at the gym right now. I'll send you the information on. We got actually we got a really good one, a really good standout amateur that just uh, joined up about three weeks ago. He's he's training with us now, and I'll send you all the information because this might be cool. a kid to keep an eye out for. Yeah, man. So, S- send me some stuff, brother. I will, man. And uh, have a great weekend, brother. Um, you too. I- I'm gonna have a drink later, to some scotch, and I'm gonna. I'm going to raise it up to you and your brother, man. Awesome, brother. That's great, man. Thank you. Take care, Mike. All right, you too, man. Bye-bye. Bye. Uh, there goes Mike Mendiolo. Great guy. I see a few of you guys on the line. Um, hold on for just a second. I want to get back to one little po- one last point that I wanted to make because I saw um, – Lobster Eleven on the chat asked about this, and a few of a few of you guys have asked about this. And he's saying, you know, for the average casual combat uh, sports fan on the street, they are more familiar with UFC women fighters than women's boxers. Uh, you, and a lot of people talk about this, and it's true. It's true, and it's there's a few reasons why. Okay, but. Um, I hear this a lot. You know, UFC female fighters are popular. Why not boxing? Is it because boxing's sexist and UFC isn't, you know, and all this other stuff? Guys, I think that they're two very different sports. First, let, let's, uh, let's have a quick biology lesson, okay? Men have more upper body strength, naturally, all right? And I know that's going to cause some conflict for some of you out there who have had Your professor in college tell you that's not true and there's no such thing as gender. Guess what? Biology and billions of years of evolution disagree with you. It doesn't mean there are not exceptions because there are. There are exceptions to every rule, okay? But for the most part, men have more upper body strength and more explosive power. And you need upper body strength and explosive twitchy power to generate knockouts, If you're just using strikes, punches, particularly against people who are trained to protect themselves from strikes, punches, however you want to word it. So people that actually know how to defend themselves and absorb punches, roll with them, parry them, et cetera, et cetera. When you're going up against them, first you got to have the skills to trick them to set up the shot. But then when you land the shot, you got to have the power generated to hurt them. That is harder to do for women. It just is naturally through biology. So in boxing, you're not going to see as many women knocking out other women. In UFC, there are different ways to get stoppages. First of all, and I'm sorry, this is going to upset some of you UFC guys. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. UFC fighters are not as good at protecting against strikes, punches, whatever you want to call it, uh, as boxers are. Because they they have to be trained in, in protecting against several different things, right? So they don't, although they don't punch particularly well, they even more so do not defend against punches particularly well. In fact, most of them are really bad at it. So over there, it's easier to knock people, it's easier to land a big shot, let's say, in MMA than in boxing. But with the women fighters over there, you can, you can submit a girl, you can get an arm bar, right? There's a million different moves you can use in wrestling core strength and lower body strength comes into play more so than upper body strength. Some of you wrestling guys out there may disagree with me, but I want to ask some of you wrestling guys. I mean, let's talk about this truthfully. In boxing, it's not that you don't need core strength. You obviously do. You need lower body strength to move around the ring, to have good footwork. You need coordination. But in wrestling, you got to have a lower center of gravity, a lower base. Your core work, your lower body work is going to come more into play in that arena, right? So women MMA fighters, women UFC fighters have more opportunities to be dominant, to score quick stoppages, explosive stoppages in that world. Let's go back to Ronda Rousey, the biggest American-born UFC star ever. And I don't think there's any disagreement on that statement. She is the biggest American UFC star. Now, uh, George St. Pierre uh, and other guys from you know, different parts of the world were bigger stars. But I think in terms of American-born, Ronda Rousey was the biggest brand ever. And 
most of her stoppages came via uh, submission, arm bars, things like that. She wasn't knocking girls out, right? So it's it's easier for somebody like Ronda Rousey who couldn't score knockouts in boxing, right? Even if she was a better boxer, it'd be much more difficult for her to do it. But over in UFC, she was dominant. She was stopping girls. She was submitting them. She was tearing their arms out of the sockets, right? Because you can do that over there. You don't need the same type of upper body strength and uh, musculature that you need to do so in boxing. So there is a big difference right there. Let me tell you guys this. If there is somewhere out there is a girl, all right, she might be three years old right now, but somewhere out there is a girl who has the talent, skills, and upper body strength and everything I just talked about. If there was a girl out there who was knocking girls out and she was good on a camera, good on a mic, good personality, marketable, it wouldn't hurt if she was easy on the eyes. It wouldn't hurt if she was good looking. But more than any of those things, if she was exciting to watch and was lining up girls and knocking them down, let me tell you something. Every fucking promoter in the sport of boxing, including guys like Al Heyman, who are not necessarily for women's boxing, right, would be jumping over each other trying to get to this woman because they know they'd have millions of dollars at stake. If there was a girl out there, again, I'll repeat this, good looking, wouldn't hurt, good on the mic, good with the interview, knew how to promote herself, was savvy on social media and with media in general, and was knocking girls out. Every fucking promoter in this sport would be fighting to sign her. That's the truth. The hard truth, guys, is that that woman doesn't exist right now. Now, maybe she's out there somewhere, but I'm telling you, all the sexist talk, all the talk of equal pay, that would disappear overnight if a woman like that appeared on the scene. Mark my fucking words. Everybody involved in this sport is trying to find the next big thing that's going to make them money. It's also an ego thing for these promoters. It's not even about making money for some of them. It's about having the best fighter because that boosts their ego. Hey, I discovered this kid. That's my fighter, right? So if you were the first to bring up the female version of Mike Tyson, if you will, they'd be all over it. Trust me, guys. There's no sexism involved here. It's really not. It's simple economics. Supply and demand. That's it. Clarissa Shields, I wish you luck over in MMA. I hope it goes well for you. Let's jump back to the phones, guys. All right. Uh, 601, you're on the line. Go. Mike, it's Joe Morgan. How you doing, brother? Joe, what's up, man? How you doing? Oh, uh, not much. I'm making, I'm cooking gumbo and having a beer right now. Nice, nice. Uh, first off, let me go ahead and get out of the way, man. I'm condolences. I know I, I hit you up earlier with everything that happened with Anthony. I'm I'm so sorry, brother. Thank you so much, Joel. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to touch kind of on what you just ended and I want to touch on the fight, uh, you know, coming up tomorrow. Um, I think one thing that a lot of people who defend shields and equal pay, et cetera, are also missing. You got to be able to market yourself. I mean, sometimes you can market yourself into payment and, you know, Katie Taylor, obviously she's got a big push in Britain, but Britain is much more, I mean, boxing is a bigger thing there, but, I mean, a perfect example to me is Ebony Bridges from Australia. I mean, yeah, she's easy on the eyes. Yeah, she's gorgeous. But she markets the hell out of herself. Right. I mean, she is always doing interviews. She's always interacting with fans on Instagram, on Twitter. I mean, I was was almost as excited about her fight that got canceled uh, against Rachel Ball because of her injury than a lot of the other fights that were going on in Britain that day. I was really looking forward to seeing her fight. And people would pay, I think, to see that, or at least pay more, because she markets herself so well and people know who she is, at least within the boxing circle. That's another part of it that I think people just, I think some people just feel like they're entitled to it because they've done X, Y, Z. Well, you may have done X, Y, Z, but if I still don't know who you are, because you're not, either your promoter isn't promoting you properly, or you're not getting out there to do it yourself, I mean... That's an important part that you gotta you got to add into it if you really want to make the money. I completely agree, man. I, that, that's exactly what it is. That's a great 
uh, example. I mean, when it comes to marketing yourself, you look at somebody like Ebony Bridges, right? And you compare her to Clarissa Shields. Now, yes, one's a little easier on the eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other is way more accomplished as a fighter. But I'm just talking in terms of personality. Clarissa comes off really divisive sometimes, really abrasive, uh, confrontational with people, uh, just very, very touchy on social media and in person. I've seen all sorts of uh, instances where she's she's gone after kids at an amateur boxing event once I saw and and the kids parents uh, you, you contrast that with the Australian girl and she's very very positive she uh, has laughs at her own expense sometimes because people go after her because she wears sexy outfits to weigh-ins she has fun with it you know and you bring me your your point brought me to this example man I was just thinking you know like Clarissa Shields yes she's accomplished a lot. But I, I don't know if you heard earlier, there's 24 rated super middleweights in the world, female super middleweights. So that she's the best out of 24. That would be like a parent who has a kid who's in a kindergarten class being the best of that kindergarten class and trying to equate their kid's accomplishment with a student at MIT, you know, like the valedictorian at Georgetown or some shit. It's not the same thing. So... Uh, I just think people forget about context, dude. They forget my favorite word, nuance. It matters. Yeah, it, it totally does. And it, it seems like, I mean, maybe this is just me being pigheaded. A lot of the time, it seems like they're, they're all for context until suddenly the context doesn't benefit them. Well, of course. Um, I mean, that's, that may be cynical of me, but it, it's it true. kind of seems that way a lot of the time. Yeah, dude. And social media and like, just turn on cable news, man. That's all it is. It's just people wanting to have that confirmation bias fed. And, um, you know, when it, when someone stands up and says, well, actually, and provides a little data, people's heads explode. Yeah. It's, lo- logic and reason discussions don't happen there about enough these yes. days, it seems like. Yes, sir. But uh, get, um, really quick, just to touch on the Spence Garcia fight, I, I swore I wasn't going to buy it. Um, I think I'm finally going to break down and buy it just because over the last couple of weeks, I'm, I'm really starting to get convinced that Spence is in a much better place mentally than he was before that accident. Hmm. Um, it just seems like, I mean, I honestly think one person who's really benefited from COVID was him because oh, he was yeah. scheduled to fight much quicker and he may have physically been ready, but I think mentally maybe the, the, you know, the switch hadn't been flipped that, oh, I really need to stop, you know, what I was doing. Because it seems like, you know, there were still occasional reports of him at least going out to parties, maybe not necessarily drinking and doing all the crazy stuff that caused the accident. But I think Hmm. the extended time that we've had because of COVID may have made him go, okay, maybe people were right. I really need to to stop this. Because he looks, I mean, he looks physically in really good shape, but he sounds a little bit more mentally focused than he was before to me. That's another great point. So I'm going to, yeah. You know, so I think I'm going to break that. My only worry is we've never really seen him have to catch, mm-hmm. but I'm worried about how he's going to catch given he now has a mess load of teeth that are quite literally anchored into his skull. I'm wondering, I mean, Garcia doesn't, he doesn't have a, a massive, punch but he's got a good left hook what happens if he i mean he's got to get past the jab you know if spence fights tall etc he could negate it but if he lands a good shot right where those teeth are now anchored into his skull i'm worried i guess i'm concerned to see how how the jaw is going to hold up to that that's my only real that's my only real concern about spence at this point mentally and physically i think he looks really good I'm just wondering how his face is as a result of that accident. Yeah, I think I think everyone shares that that same question. I saw a few guys in the chat saying the same thing. So that's the intrigue to this fight. If this fight happened a year ago, I don't think it'd be as intriguing as it is right now. You know what I'm saying? I think uh, those questions about Spence's chin are out there. When, when you know, I've had people ask me, "Well, man, look at Kell Brook. You know, because he had his orbital bone, basically his face rebuilt." And how that affects everything. And I'm thinking, yeah, I get that. But the orbital bone and everything, that's related to sight, 
all those bones and all that are closer to the brain. They're higher up on the head, closer to the brain. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're going to jolt you more a shot right there. It, it's, call me crazy, but having those steel rods put into his jaw, it may have made Spence's jaw stronger. We won't know until we know, but I just don't know if, if that injury is going to affect him as much as an injury to the orbital bone or you know, um, high up on the head. We'll find out. We'll find out. I don't think Garcia is going to be the one to answer those questions, but, but hopefully Agreed. we'll find out at some point. I hear you, man. Yeah, man, I'll I let agree. you get back to the calls. It is, it is good to talk to you again, brother. Thank you so much, Joe. Have a good one. Enjoy your gumbo, my man. You too, man. Take care. All right. There he goes. All right. Uh, another super chat pledge from Trent Non I haven't seen you on the chat lately, man. It's good to see you back. Thank you so much. He says, is Josh Taylor, Jose Colors Ramirez winner? more likely to fight Crawford at 147 or Tiafima Lopez for all four belts at 140? And then uh, there's another question. Let me, let me start with that one. Um, I think he's, I think the winner between Taylor and Ramirez is uh, more likely to fight Tiafima Lopez because I think Terrence Crawford may end up leaving top rank. Also, uh, top rank is all in on the Tiafima Lopez business and they will move heaven and earth to get him the best fight at 140 as soon as they can. It might be one more fight at 135 for him, then maybe one warm-up fight at 140, and then right to the champ, uh, whether it's Taylor or Ramirez. I really think that fight is very possible the next 12 to 18 months. I, I'd prefer it be within the next 12 months, but it, you know the business of boxing, it might take like 18 months. But I think that fight is very, very possible. Um, and if you put a gun in my head and ask, I would, I would say, yeah, that fight ends up happening for sure. All right, second part of his question. Are Ergashev, Madrimov, uh, Bully Beck, or are Giasov getting title shots next year? Um, several of them are, yes. Uh, they're going to have to, unfortunately, they're pretty much all going to have to work through the sanctioning organization uh, system. Now, if it wasn't for covid I would say pretty much all of them would be getting a title shot by the end of next year. But all these mandatories and everything pretty much got put on hold for a calendar year because of the lockdown and the quarantine. So some of these guys, it might take them till 2022, but they're all going to be avoided, bro. But I would, I think a couple of them will be able to get uh, chunks of titles next year. They'll work their way into mandatory positions, win the eliminator fight, it might be like the WBA interim or silver diamond, whatever the hell it is, that kind of a thing. Uh, but yeah, man, it might have got pushed back another year. We'll, we'll see. But I absolutely think a couple of those guys, like Madrimov, Ergashev, uh, should be fighting for at least a piece of a title next year. Good stuff, man. Um, MJB Taco in the, ask, uh, in, in the chat ask a good question. What's up, Barrio? It's good to hear from you, bro. He says, so, so are those rods in Errol Spence's mouth what affect his speech? Good question. Well, I will say this. Errol Spence is a country boy. He's always had kind of a draw about him. His family's from Jamaica. A lot of Jamaican people um, talk with a kind of a slower country kind of dialect. You know, I actually dated a bunch of Jamaican girls when I was younger. So I got to know a lot of them and their speech patterns and stuff. And they kind of talk. Not Southern, I mean, Patois and all that's very different, but they kind of have a draw to their speech. So Errol Spence already has that heritage on his father's side, I believe. And then growing up in Dallas or outside of Dallas, he's got that Texas draw, that Matthew McConaughey thing happening. And then, yeah, man, maybe the rods, he's still adjusting. Think of it, man, like if uh, you see people that have those Invisalign things in their teeth, um, that's going to affect your speech until you get used to it, like a retainer, braces. That's kind of what he's going through, man. So, yeah, it might take a year or so for all that to, to normalize for him. You know what I'm saying? But, yeah, that, that's a good question, man. Uh, probably to a certain extent, yeah. All right, let's jump back to the phones, guys. 773, you're on the line. Go. Hey, Michael, how the hell y'all doing? What's up, man? How you doing? Man, I just got to say, when it comes to fighter pay, uh, there's men out there making so much money, and I just can't see them being bigger draw than Clarissa Shields. 
I mean, you look at some of these paychecks, some of these boxers get, they can't draw flies this shit. <laughs> You're telling me they're they're getting paid so much more than Clarissa Shields? Like That's who? Like, like, like a Billy Joe Saunders, let's say? I'm, I'm not going to name, I can't, I'm not going to name them off the top of my head, but I just, you look at some of these fighter pay, men's, in the men's, and they get paid some astronomical amounts. And I don't think they're bringing in big time eyeballs. Look at the um, ratings on TV. A lot of garbage ratings. Terrible. That's fair. And these are not even maybe champions. You I know will... what I mean? That's the only problem I have. No, you raise you raise a good point. You raise a very very good point. Uh, but we can compare what some of these male fighters are making compared to other male fighters. Like I w- I w- I've talked about this before, where a mediocre heavyweight is going to make more than a championship level bantamweight. You know what I'm saying? Like a pound for pound level guy like Juan Francisco Estrada makes a fraction of somebody like Gerald Washington when he steps up and fights on one of these PBC on Fox events or something like that. And uh, I love Gerald. Awesome guy. Good dude. Um, But I'm, I'm just saying at a pound for pound scale, he's nowhere near Juan Francisco Estrada. So some of it does come down to marketability to a casual sports fan in America, they're going to want to watch Gerald Washington before they watch Juan Francisco Estrada. They might even want to go buy a ticket for to a fight for Gerald Washington before Juan Francisco Estrada. I'll just say this much, okay? Boxing promoters are smart and they will find a way to make money. The market demands what you are worth. So, yes, there are some boxers out there pulling fast ones on dudes, right, Uh, and getting paid. But sometimes you get like, okay, Danny Jacobs got $10 million against Canelo Alvarez. He did not deserve that payday, but he was right place, right time, and he had gone through the gauntlet fighting uh, Gennady Golovkin and Sergei Derevyanchenko. He had been on Showtime and HBO for years, and he was known among the uh, boxing fans in the New York area. So, yeah, did he rate $10 million? Hell no. Right place, right time. He pulled a fast one on the promotion. It does happen. But you do bring up a fair point. I do agree with you on that. Yeah, that's the problem. Like, I have no problem with, um, if you bring in more money, you deserve, you bring in viewership, you bring the eyeballs to the sport, and you deserve more money. I agree 100%. This is a business. Um, you look at someone like Jake Paul, like that's what people are mad about him about. And that's a perfect example. You can cry all you want, all these professionals, Antonio Tarver saying, I want to come out and fight him. People will care about Jake Paul more than a retired Antonio Tarver regarding the championships. He can be all the champions he wants. And that's the fact of the matter. Um, so I kind of see it both ways. This is why I love amateur wrestling because, it says they don't make no money. There's no money involved. It's they don't care who wins. There's no incentive to get. Oh, this guy needs to win, so he's going to bring in more money. It's a structure, a tournament style structure. It's a point structure. There's no judges and this and that. You get a takedown, you get two points. That's what I love about it. But in boxing, it's oh, this business, and oh, he brings in more money. Well, their judges are this way. There's just so much politics and bullcrap involved. But I have one issue to pick with you regarding Ronda Rousey. She was the big star in regards to like the mainstream media, the popularity contest, all the magazines loved her because she was the first women. They did they were doing that whole women's empowerment deal, you know, woke sports ESPN style. <laughs> but in terms of pay per view buys, it really wasn't. She really wasn't that big of a pay per view star. You look at guys like Brock Lesnar, um just the Enjoyed her when it comes to pay per view buys, and there's a whole list of other guys who did way better. But the media jumped on that, and she was a big the women's empowerment thing. You know how they love eating that up. But that's the only thing I got to say about that. Any any rebuttals? No, you're you're right. I mean, I don't know Brock Lesnar's pay per view numbers and Ronda's. I just remember in terms of. Um, I, I took a lot of shit, man. In fact, I, I got some heat on like a, a feminist website once because I did a video talking about just what you mentioned, man. Ronda Rousey, I think she won the SB Fighter of the Year. I believe it was Fighter of the Year over like Floyd Mayweather. 
And her accomplishments, yeah, I get that she was, you know, stopping all these women and stuff, but she was fighting in a horribly weak division. And her accomplishments were dwarfed by many other MMA fighters, let alone boxers. It was politically driven. It was an agenda. And I talked about that and I took a lot of shit for it. I just remember Rhonda seemed to be everywhere in media. I understand why. My point why I brought Rhonda up, whether she's the biggest star ever or not, fine. She's certainly up there, okay? But her commercial appeal, whether it, it translated to pay-per-view buys or not, dude, she was in movies. She was on TV shows. She was on, like, the, the, the Entourage movie. I remember that. She was all over magazines, right? If there is a woman's boxer who is knocking out girls like that, she'd be just as famous as Ronda Rousey. I just, it would, it would happen. It's just that girl just doesn't exist. You know what I'm saying? Well, I agree hundred percent in regards to that. And Carissa Shields, Shields, the problem with Shields is she's trying to do the, um, hate me. You're going to hate me. So you want to tune in to watch me lose weight. Right. It, it's not working. Like nope. she, no one even cares about her. Like she's trying to go to that. I'll beat triple G in a boxing match and oh, I'll fight Jake Paul. Blah, blah. She says a lot of ridiculous stuff, and it's not working. She, she, I'm not, I don't mean to be rude, but no one wants to see a hood rat with an attitude going there and fight. And that's what she is. And she, she proved well, it time and time again with her attitude and just the way she carries herself. Those are your words. Those are and, not my words. Those are your 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 words. I just want to put that out there. And I, I'll, I'll stand by them proud and day. You, you, and I don't want to bring in, but what her, her trainer did? Didn't her trainer knock someone out or something? I forget what happened. She's her been brother. involved in some uh, some bad situations. People around her, family members, people in her corner. Yeah, you know, um, the whole quote thing, calling herself the greatest woman of all time. Um, you know, the, it's just not working. It's not working when, when again, six of the eight world titles you've won were vacant. And my thing, too, with Clarissa Shields, man, is she's constantly calling out these men. She's calling out Triple G, Jake Paul, whoever, right? And meanwhile, and I'm going to go back to it, uh, Katie Taylor. I've never heard Katie Taylor call, call out a male fighter. I, I don't remember hearing Layla Ali call out male fighters or uh, fighters like Mia St. John and Christy Martin ever calling out male fighters. Clarissa Shields is, is trying to develop this like us versus them thing that made Floyd a lot of money. But Floyd did that after he had become a star. He flipped that switch and it put him from a star to a superstar with, with a particular people who kind of wanted to, to buy into that narrative. But man, with Clarissa, like you said, just, she's just not there and it's not working. You know what I'm saying? So, so if she would just call out other female fighters and focus on building up women's boxing instead of bitching all the time about what the men are doing and calling out all these male fighters, she'd be a lot less divisive and abrasive to people. I just the people around her, I'll say this dude, and then I'm sorry, I'll, I'll stop rambling and let you finish. But um, I, none of the major promoters in the sport of boxing went after Clarissa Shields. The top ranks who have female fighters, Matchroom has invested heavily in women's boxing. Golden Boy Promotions has invested in women's boxing. PBC doesn't do women's boxing, but you would think for someone like Clarissa Shields, she'd be right up their alley. None of them went after her, dude. She signed with a, a mid-tier level promoter, and there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. Yeah, there's a term in professional uh, WWE, WWF back in the day. It was... It's uh, cheap heat. It's not cheap heat, but it's like, there's like a term where you get people to hate you. That's your goal. You want to get people riled up and become the heel. But it actually turns into they don't even want to watch you. Like your goal is to make people hate you so they want to see you lose or whatever. But, it, but it, what ends up happening is they don't even want to watch you. And I think that's what's happening with Carissa here. She's come to a point where they don't care. Like just, just go away. Just get off the TV screen your outrageous cakes about fighting men and doing this and that. People are just like, they're done with it. They're over it. I think that's what happened with Chris and Shields. But I'll leave it to it, Mike. Have a great day. Thanks a lot, man. You too. Yeah, and I, again, I want to state this for the record. I got nothing against Clarissa Shields. And, like, I don't have a bone to pick or anything like that. I'm just talking about the reality of this situation, guys. And 
there's a, there's other female boxers that kind of do the same thing she does to a lesser extent that um, get it's not that they get on my nerves. I just I, I look at it and I think you're not going to break through with this type of attitude. I see Michaela Mayer doing some of that stuff sometimes. I see Amanda Serrano doing some of that stuff sometimes. Um, Heather Hardy. And it's like, man, pull back on that. Stop bitching about men. Stop bitching about what men make. Stop calling out male fighters. Stop making it about gender all the time. Just build up your product. Take your product and make it better. Work with the people in the business and your constituents to make your product better. That's what they should be focused on instead of just bitching all the time. And it's not that they don't work their ass off because they all do. You guys see the training clips. Amanda Serrano posts some stuff all the time. She's constantly in the gym. I absolutely believe that she is a skilled martial artist. She is. She knows what she's doing, okay? Um, the, some of these female fighters, well, a lot of them work very, very hard, and they are skilled. But some seem to understand how to market themselves, and some don't. And it's the same thing with male fighters. Somebody like Terrence Crawford, for all his accomplishments, Terrence Crawford should be making $10 million a year or something, you know, uh, but he's not. And he should be uh, setting, uh, not setting records, but doing big viewership numbers. He's not because his personality is abrasive. He's hard to work with. Everyone at top, right, well, I'm not going to, I heard things, okay? People are getting fed up with his bullshit. He's difficult to work with. He's not particularly good on camera, on the mic. Awesome fighter, good person, good guy, but just not the most marketable guy out there. So that's going to cost him in the end. That's the business. All right, let's jump to another call real quick. 447, you are on the line. Go. Hello, Mike. It's Hamid. Hi, man. What's, What's up, man? man? Yeah, how's it going, brother? It's good to hear you talking and doing these Friday, whatever, afternoon Friday night chats. Uh, I just want to talk about a couple of stuff. Uh, first thing regarding Shields, I didn't hear the interview. I only just seen that the clip uh, I think it's on TMZ, as you said. So yeah. I'll check. I'll check it out. I know it's only a couple of minutes, but I did post something. I don't, I don't always agree with Steve Kim, but I'm not gonna lie. Everything he said in that interview, I think, is from last year. I think he pretty much hit the nail on the head. Like uh, Shields is talking about boxing in America, like he's calling, uh, like saying there's some sort of agenda, but. Boxing is a niche sport in America, last I checked. Uh, it is bigger in Europe. Uh, and female boxing is obviously going to be even smaller. But like what Steve Kim was saying, uh, she, I think, went about 11 or 12 fights without scoring a knockdown. So right. I don't think she's a fan-friendly fighter. Against and, against bad opposition. Yeah. Let's be yeah, honest. That's thing. Yeah. A week in titles. I think it's six week in titles. So. Right. I don't. I don't think you can blame the American public if the opposition to fighting is limited and you're not really knocking them out as well. So, like, if you look at Katie Taylor and Cecilia Brinkos, they're much bigger. And they, uh, that just shows, I think, boxing and women's boxing generally is bigger in Europe and in the UK. Yes. And I think Brinkos was a paper view star even in Norway. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, I just don't think Shields has pleased the public and hasn't been as impressive. She may have won all those fights, but some of those fights she's been dropped in. I think I've seen one. She's It's kind of been lackluster fight. So I do get it. Some people do, I think, uh, over-criticize it and like, go a bit over the top. Like I think uh, there are some people who will probably give it no credit whatsoever, but I don't think she's the person that helps her situation. Like, I know she's won two gold medals, but when you're starting to compare your amateur success with Lomachenko, Lomachenko or Rudyao, <laughs> like, that's <laughs> ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, and you're calling out Golovkin. I mean, that's just absurd. I think maybe the team, if there's a better team around her, I know she's got a couple of guys from HBO, which uh, should should have helped her out, or maybe have to a degree, but I think the PR team haven't been great. And some of the personal team, like the whole fighting with uh, 
James Alia Bashir, that, that wasn't a good look. I know he wasn't here, and I, I do think that was kind of unfortunate that he's going to get all the bad rep, but the team that was surrounding her, they obviously are not good people, and you shouldn't be around those people. So, regarding that, I do think that you can't always play the victim, because right. uh, regarding Crawford, I do think Crawford does do good ratings, because the fight with Benavides and the fight with... Good point. Uh, You're right. Brock did do high rated. Did You're high right. Rated. I know. I do know Crawford doesn't market himself well though, and isn't as open. But Crawford still, uh, how do I put it? Still is uh, getting people to watch him, and he did uh, do about fourteen thousand in MSG. I I know that fight with Khan probably shouldn't have been pay per view, but no way. that fight did. I, I think it did about same as Wilder's pay per view with Ortiz. So. I think Crawford's been promoted well by his promoters. Himself, he probably hasn't done a good job, but I look at guys like Walder, and I, I question their promoters. Like, I don't think they've done a really good job with him. Like, I, I know he had the fight with Fury, but outside that, it took a really long time for him to get to pay-per-view or even sell out the arenas. I don't, I don't think he did sell out the arenas, actually. I don't think he ever has. Not by himself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think Crawford. Uh, he's a welterweight as well. With a heavyweight, I think it's a bit different. Uh, mm. So I, I think Crawford could do better. I, do, I don't think he's a bit passive. He doesn't do as many interviews and stuff like that. Similar to I think uh, Andre Ward in a way, but I do think the guy is crowd pleasing and fan friendly, and that I think. Yeah, yeah he's one of my favorite fighters. fighters to watch. I mean, Terence Crawford yeah. has that old school Sonny Liston mean streak in him. He he's must watch TV for me. I always catch his fights live. He's one of those guys. I don't wait till the next day to watch or anything. You got to see him fight. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And uh, I know there's a couple of people, and I think there's a caller as well on your show. You have seen, and I seen. I think Steve Kim pointed out. He's asking a question about in Dongo. I don't think in Dongo's his best win, but when Crawford beat him, he wasn't beaten and he was a unified champion. And I'm not saying he was better than when Usyk beat Gaskev, but Crawford dealt with him how he should have dealt with him. And that was a pretty good performance. I, I know Dongo after that hasn't done that well, but at the time he beat him, he, that was a good win. And Dongo did have a couple of good wins over Ricky Burns and uh, Trinovsky. Trinovsky. So yeah. uh, when people say he's the worst unified champion, I'm not sure. I think J Rock, you could argue, and I know J Rock did have a very good win over Hurt, and even a guy like uh, Rosario. Both these guys never made the defense of the title, and I, I think you could argue those guys may have been worse. Uh, if you're talking about uh, technically, I think maybe you could say they were better than Ndongo because Ndongo is a bit off balance and the way he comes lunging in at times. Yeah, but yeah I, I think, I do think Crawford uh, gets a bit over-criticized. Like, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens after this weekend's fight. It is a big fight and I do agree that with one of the callers that if Garcia lands, it could be interesting. Uh, I think it is, uh, I'm not sure, I think it is worse to get hit uh, by the chin if that's like, because, uh, especially if you've had an operation and stuff like that, because I think the nerve damage, uh, I don't know if that's true, but on the eye, I know I know it's bad as well if you have got like broken eye sockets like Brooke did, but on the chin, I think it is the chin. Once you get hit on the chin, that's it. Normally, most of the times do go down. I do think Spence should win, but I don't think it's a mismatch like some people are making out. Like We don't know... Uh, how much Spence has lost or how he is. But do you think if Spence was to do a, say, an absolute number on him, on Danny Garcia, which I don't think many people have done, like a, pro, a, a complete whitewash, and ends up stopping him, say, in eight or nine rounds, that's something you could say that justifies a pound-for-pound pound top spot for him? I wouldn't say pound-for-pound pound top spot, but it would certainly move him up. And it, it put him... No, 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 no number one. Not number one, but like okay. say top five. Top oh, yeah, five. absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think um, nobody has decisively dominated Danny Garcia. So if he were to do that, particularly coming off of this accident and everything, um, that would that would be a huge statement. 
I don't expect it, but it would be a big statement. Yeah, I I think um, I do think Danny Garcia is a well to it. Is a bit I don't know if overrated is the right word, but he's I don't think he's achieved as much as he did at one forty. I know I've oh, seen yeah. some guy making ridiculous statements like saying. Danny Garcia's resume is better than Golovkin's, which I had a back and forth it's, with. But it's ridiculous. To me, Danny has not done anything since 2013, beating Lucas Matisse. And that's a long, long time ago. Like, I don't think the same fight was close. I think you could argue, say, but one nine, maybe even 10 rounds in that fight. Uh, yeah. Portofan was close, but I thought Porto beat him. But, like, he hasn't done much recently. I, I know he's had the odd few good performances or whatever stoppages here and there, but I think if he wins this fight against Spence, you could say this is probably his best win, but... Oh, not even been close, a long time yeah. He, That'd be yeah. his best win by far. Yeah, it'll be a really good win, but I, it's been a really long time. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't trust too much, I wouldn't put too much stock in him, like... Uh, a welterweight, uh, at times, uh, to me, it looks like he hasn't... I don't know who said it recently. I heard someone on one of the other shows. It looks like he doesn't give his all. And that's the thing I, I do have an uh, issue with, Danny Garcia. I, I do think at 140, he was a lot more effective and better. Even though I thought maybe Lamont Peterson might have beaten him, I do think that fight, he did do really well for the first six or seven rounds. Uh, well, you could say Peterson it didn't do nothing as well at the same time. But since he's moved up to welterweight, uh, I just, I don't think he, I don't think he's a lead welterweight. I, he could prove me wrong this Saturday, but up till now, I, I just don't think uh, he's been a lead welterweight. I think for Spence, uh, the thing I agree with you is if he, if he could separate himself from say a guy like Danny Garcia, then I think that you could say is a statement. Uh, I know he had a couple of fights where they weren't the greatest of performances. With like Mike, I know he won every round with Mikey, but he should have really stopped him. Although I don't mm. really criticize him too much. But then the Porter fight that was a close fight. Uh, I think the knockdown, or maybe an extra round, won it. But a question I wanted to ask before I drop off is: say after this fight, uh, Spence doesn't look good. Say he looks about seventy, eighty percent. Would you rather see him fight someone like I don't? I don't think it'll probably happen. But would you rather see him fight someone like Keith Thurman or Sean Porter in a rematch? If you can't, uh, if you can't get the Pacquiao fight, or would you rather he just go straight into a fight with Crawford? I just for for the betterment of boxing, I'd rather him go straight into a fight with Crawford. I mean, Styles make fights. This is his first fight in a year, actually a little over a year. So if he has a little rust early on against Garcia, it doesn't look great. But grind. let's say he grinds out a 115-113 win that looks kind of similar to his fight with Porter. Uh, some people will criticize that. But given he's coming off an injury, it's a layoff, all these things, I, I, would, I would think he's, he's as ready for Crawford as he's ever going to be. So if that fight could happen next, absolutely, that's what I'd want. Do I think it'll happen? Hell no. <laughs> it will not happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree. I, I do want to see that fight sooner rather than later, but I, yeah. I am hearing that. If he wins, I, I don't know if it's true. They're already lining up a fight with Porter in a rematch, which is not a bad fight, but I don't think we really need to see that. We don't need to see that's that. That's the bad thing. Yeah, especially yeah, it's going to be on Fox pay per view. I mean, we just don't need to see it. I thought it was close this fight with Porter, but I was up front, saw it close to personal right there, ringside. I thought he won. I think you could make an argument he won eight rounds. Some people had it seven five. That's fine, but I thought he did enough to beat yeah. Porter. Dropped him late. Let's move on. Let's 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 get to some other fights, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I definitely think he won six rounds. I think it would go far up to about eight. I think about seven, probably five with the knockdown was fair. I, I was, Before I drop out, I forgot. I was going to ask one more thing. With uh, the pay-per-view price, I didn't watch the whole Tyson uh, was the Jones card. I fell asleep. It was too late. But I did manage to catch a bit of the, I think it's the Badu Jack fight, a bit of the production. And I, I do think they did a good job, but... A lot, a lot of people did buy into. I know it's due to Tyson, but it was fifty dollars. Do you think, with so many fights going to pay per view, do you think they should cut down the price for certain fights, or do you think? uh, I think absolutely. Do you think it depends? Well, no. I I think that 
listen, the price, the reduced price, you got to think, man, it's, it's not just for people like us, but it's also for commercial businesses. I saw so many bars here in Atlanta. This is not exactly a boxing hotbed where I live now. There were bars all over the place, downtown and in the suburbs that had Tyson and Jones. And I think a big part of it is because of that reduced price tag. And the bars I saw that had it were not charging a cover. They were confident enough that they were going to get enough people, you know, enough people flowing in that they didn't have to charge a cover. But when you're charging eighty dollars, you got to think, man, that's what we're paying. But if you're a bar and you have forty TVs, you're paying a lot more than eighty dollars because they're paying per unit. So um, it, it it increases the price exponentially for those guys. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to say you can't charge fights like a lot of these little fair enough eighty dollars, but then you can't charge fights like uh, Khan Crawford, Waldo right. Ortiz, eighty dollars. Like it, 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 that just loses the value of pay per view. But I do think they should try and go back to what they used to do. I think Crawford and Postol that was like I think fifty dollars. Maybe yeah. if they could reduce the price, then maybe the uh, pay per view numbers could uh, go up as well. But thanks for taking my call, Mike. I appreciate thanks, it. Man. I'll speak to you soon. All right, man. Have a good weekend. All right, you too. Yeah, and that uh, segues me into the final uh, point that I wanted to make, guys. I wanted to hit on the Tyson Jones thing because, again, this brought up a lot of people on boxing Twitter. You know, they think it's the end of the universe because Tyson Jones apparently – now, look, this hasn't been validated or substantiated, but it hasn't been disputed either. So apparently a, an anonymous network source is saying that that Tyson vs. Jones pay-per-view did 1.2 to 1.5 million buys. Now, I should state, 1.5 million buys at 50 bucks a pop versus 1 million buys at $80 a pop, okay, it's pretty much even. So keep in mind, pay-per-view buys doesn't necessarily equate the same revenue. It depends on the price of the pay-per-view and the provider. What I don't know is, because uh, this was on some streaming service called Triller. Now, normally, if you do a pay-per-view on, let's say, Fox or ESPN, Showtime, that pay-per-view provider is taking half of the revenue off the top. What I don't know is if there is a different deal built in for this thing with Triller, and maybe they got less. Maybe they took a third or something because it was this new streaming app. That I don't know. Okay, I honestly do not know. So perhaps the promotion kept more of the money than 50%, or maybe it was whacked up 50-50 like the, the, what traditionally happens. But um, I, I tweeted about this, and some people took it the wrong way, not surprisingly, hashtag 2020. But you have one pay-per-view between 50-year-olds, 54 and 51, I think, Tyson and Jones were, going up against the Charlo doubleheader, which did about 100,000. Uh, Tank Davis versus Leo Santa Cruz did about 200,000. Spence versus Garcia, I think we'll do somewhere in the neighborhood of 350, maybe somewhere around there. If, if we're being generous, probably 300,000. Um, Spence versus Mikey Garcia last year was reported at doing 350. A lot of that was Mikey Garcia. He was the commercial A side in that promotion, but it did build Spence's brand. And I think that will carry over to his fight with Danny Garcia. However, Spence versus Mikey did about 350. Spence versus Porter, I saw reports ranging anywhere from like 280 to 350. So I think it did a little less than Spence's fight with Mikey Garcia. Um, Bud Crawford against Amir Khan did about 150,000 from what I heard. Okay, so all those combined did maybe 1.5 million, and I'm including Spence versus Danny Garcia tomorrow. About 1.5 million, okay? So collectively, and sometimes these numbers do get exaggerated, guys. Collectively, how many pay-per-views is that? One, two, three, four, five, six shows did the same as one show. Six shows involving some of the best fighters currently on earth going up against two guys in their 50s in an exhibition match where it was announced beforehand there would be no winner, okay? And it did as many buys. What does that tell you? That tells you that none of the fights I mentioned should have been on pay-per-view. That is the difference between this era and the previous era. And I get accused of beating up on PBC. 
And trust me, guys, I'm not an anti-PBC person. You guys know because we've had PBC fighters on the show. I've traveled thousands of miles. I covered both of those Errol Spence fights last year ringside. I flew thousands of miles to do so to cover them for ring. Um, I, I've, I've written about PBC fighters and covered their events for years. I think they started, what, 2014, 2015? But the business model, it's not just there. There's pay-per-views overseas. Eddie Hearn with Matchroom does a million pay-per-views, although they're much cheaper. Uh, Top Rank last year did a pay-per-view with uh, with Terrence Crawford, that fight that did not belong on pay-per-view. I understand it's not just PBC, but dude, they're hitting you guys with what, four of them this year? One, two, maybe three. Three of them this year. We don't know if Pacquiao is going to fight. Probably he's not going to fight. So three pay-per-views here post-COVID during a, a lockdown, during a time where, you know, record unemployment and stuff. Well, not all-time record, but for decades, right? The worst unemployment for decades. Like, that, that isn't helping the sport of boxing. And I'm concerned about it because imagine if that Charlo doubleheader was on regular Fox. Imagine if when Spence fought Mikey Garcia last year in front of 50,000-plus fans at AT&T Stadium in Arlington, that was on regular Fox. Tank Davis versus Leo Santa Cruz. Imagine if that was on regular Showtime, Right. Uh, Terrence Crawford versus Amir Khan, if that was on regular ESPN, that helps build these fighters' brands. And I'm going to stick with PBC because, look, say what you will about Top Rank and ESPN, and they've pulled some stunts I don't agree with. Top Rank is guilty as anybody else of pulling some of the stunts that have further diminished boxing in America, but they've also helped build it up at the same time, particularly globally. A lot of the global expansion of boxing, Top Rank did assist in that. Uh, particularly Latin America, the Asian markets, and now they're working with Eastern European fighters, which they resisted for a while. But anyway, man, if you if you just look at the, the PBC fighters, guys like Errol Spence, guys like uh, uh, Tank, Javante G- Davis, even the Charlo brothers, they should be much bigger stars than they are. Uh, Deontay Wilder, I talked about this before. When Deontay Wilder was first coming up, why wasn't he on Floyd Mayweather undercards? He should have been on every Floyd Mayweather show on the undercard. That's how they should have been building him. Uh, he could have been even bigger than he was, right, at, at his peak. And and look, they manicured that career and took a very limited guy and got him a lot of money. And finally, the bubble got burst. But they did well by him by getting him all that money before it happened. Okay, I get that. But, man, the pay-per-views right now, guys, since 2019 forward, the, the it's four or five of them a year are what you're going to get on that side of the street. That is part of the plan that they have, the new deals that they've set up. Once the time-by deals all expired, the new deals that they've set up going forward uh, with, with Showtime and particularly with Fox, you're going to get like four or five pay-per-views a year. And that's limiting the audience, and that is hurting the sport. Mike Tyson did not fight on pay-per-view until he was a superstar, until he was the most famous athlete on earth. There was a point, some of you younger guys just don't know about this, but there was a point, man, where he was more popular than just about anybody at that time in the late 80s, even in the early 90s when he was in legal trouble. He was all over the place. And he started going to pay-per-view in the 90s. I understand the business of boxing changed. Pay-per-view became way too common. But even in the 90s, as much as we bitched about pay-per-view then, we had HBO Boxing After Dark. And and fights that normally now go straight to pay-per-view were on HBO week after week after week, guys. Pay-per-view used to be a thing where the, the absolute superstars, the absolute super fights went over there, Okay. That's not the case anymore. And these pay-per-views are really killing the sport, dude. The way you guys fight back is by, uh, like I say, using your wallet. Your wallet is your voice, and that's how you fight back, man. All right. Uh, We are wrapped up on the phones. I got everything off my chest. I'm looking forward to the fights tomorrow. I hope you guys have a good weekend. We will do TNC Monday. Until then, I'll see you at the fights.